Holy One, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please have a seat. Well, it's a great joy to be here today. I'm looking forward to getting blisters on my hands with all these receptions, confirmations, and baptisms. Um, and I bring you greetings from all your fellow Episcopalians from Covington to Middlesbrough, Frankfurt to Ashland, some six and a half thousand of us, and we are growing. Praise be to God. Well, as we said, baptisms, confirmations, receptions, reaffirmations, and lunch to boot. Today is a day of celebration. Alleluia. Well, we heard much the same thing in the book of Acts where we read, So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. We've got some work to do. I don't know if we'll make 3,000, but it's going to be a good day. And just like the early church, today's celebration is founded on one shattering historical event, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The Jewish people had been waiting for God to send his Messiah to deliver Israel and establish God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. Many thought that Jesus might be the one. The two travelers to Emmaus were just such folks, but after his arrest, trial, and execution, they had lost all hope. Then Jesus appears and begins to walk alongside them, just as he does today with us. He starts by scolding them for being so thick-headed and hard-hearted because they did not understand why it was necessary for the Messiah to first suffer before achieving victory. So he spells it out for them, starting with Moses and then all the prophets. You see, God had been making this plan from the very beginning, and all the promises that had been made to the people of Israel were now being fulfilled in Jesus. When they arrived at their destination, the two asked Jesus to come in and eat supper with them. At table, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened. They saw and they believed. After Jesus left, they went back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles how he had been made known to them by the opening up of the scriptures and the sharing of the bread. Word and sacrament, the core of our Anglican liturgy, still makes Jesus known to us today. But there are different levels of knowing. I can stand here today in front of you in all honesty and tell you that I know President Joe Biden. I've seen him on TV. <laughs> I've heard his speeches. I've read some of his policies. I know Biden. But this knowing is not the same as me telling you that I know my firstborn son, Jake Robert. For Jake, I was there at his birth, changed his diapers, watched him take his first steps, heard his first words. I taught him to catch and ride a bike, wept at his pain, rejoiced in his achievements. I watched him grow into a young man and marry and now he, too, is about to become a father. You see, I know Jake at the very core of my being. Now God, by the death and resurrection of Jesus, invites you 
to know him in this same way. A relationship which will change your life forever. This happens, says St. Peter, through baptism. The sign and seal of becoming part of the Jesus movement. Baptism begins with our repentance as we turn from a focus on self to declare that Jesus is Lord, Lord of your life and Lord of all the world. And we accept him as our Savior, the one who redeems you from sin and death. In baptism, you are forgiven, receive the Holy Spirit, and are adopted to live as one of God's children, the church. All three strands, repentance, forgiveness, and adoption, are woven from the gospel truth into the way of love. Archbishop Rowan Williams once said, truth makes love possible. Love makes truth bearable. When we say yes to God's truth, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in mutual love. But this truth is not a set of rules, practices, or teachings. It is a person, and his name is Jesus. For far too many Christians, this has remained but an intellectual assent. We have examined the evidence, found it compelling, and said, yes, this is good as far as it goes. But it does not lead to transformation, to life in all its abundance. We need more to face the challenges of daily life and to taste the richness that God has in store for you. It's a bit like a group of little children who were taken to the city swimming pool on a hot August day for the first time. They saw the fresh blue water dip their toes into its coolness, but unless they jump in, they will never experience the sheer joy of floating, frolicking, and swimming in the pool. On a hot August day, there is a world of difference between looking at a pool and jumping into the water. Saying yes to God brings you to the edge of the pool, but it is only when you jump in that you experience the Spirit. The great Anglican theologian of the 16th century, Richard Hooker, writes, all receive not the grace of God, which receive the sacraments of his grace. Just because we come to the pool does not mean we will experience the joy of swimming. We must get in the water. Baptism must lead to discipleship, and that is why we have the ancient church practice of confirmation. Some say confirmation was invented because bishops didn't have anything to do. <laughs> that may be true. But confirmation is also a wonderful opportunity to profess the faith that was promised at your baptism and is now maturing in your life. In confirmation, the candidate confirms all that was received and with the laying on of hands and the anointing with holy oil, God confirms that he will be with you and strengthen you on your journey of faith. So there really are two confirmations. The candidate confirms their Christian faith and God confirms his presence, protection, and promised strength for the road ahead. In this way, confirmation is kind of housekeeping right to bring the candidate into full accreditation within this Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. Baptism marks you as part of the body of Christ, 
the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Confirmation declares that you are now a full communicant with legal standing in the life of the Episcopal Church. And we now commission you for service. All this is possible only because of the resurrection. For without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith, no hope, no baptism, no church. The resurrection of Jesus is the pinnacle of the cosmic story to restore all people to unity with God and each other through Christ Jesus. And now he sends his spirit to warm your hearts through the scriptures and open your eyes to know him in the breaking of the bread. The spirit of Christ is forming you into a distinctive people to join in God's great mission to put this world right again as you proclaim the truth to the world that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Amen. <laughs>